It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Alison McGrath, a man with three doctorates as is an expert in molecular biophysics, theology, and intellectual history. He's taught both here in Cambridge and at Oxford, where he currently holds the Andreas Idriot Professorship of Science and Faith. A former atheist, he's now an ordained Anglican priest and director of the Ian Ramsey Centre for Science and Religion. He's debated some of the most prominent atheists of our time, including Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, and Richard Dawkins, who interviewed him in response to one of his books, Dawkins' God. Professor McGrath is talking tonight on his own experience of being both a scientist and a Christian, and why he believes those two aspects of himself are completely compatible. Uh, we'll have some time at the end for a Q&A, so do be storing up any questions that you'd like to ask. So that's it from me, so please join me in welcoming Professor Alison McGrath. Great to be here in Cambridge. I'm Alistair, I'm from Oxford. Um, but I have two very happy years here as a chair of John, so um, to, uh, there's a link here. The topic I'm going to deal with is exactly that. I'm going to talk about science and faith, and really what I'm going to try and do is simply say, look, these are really big questions. And I'm sure many of you have begun to think about these, and what I'm going to do is simply add some food before. I'm going to tell you what I find interesting, what I find helpful, in the hope this may be useful and interesting to you as well. And so basically, which, this lecture just has three parts. I'm going to talk a bit about how I moved from atheism to Christianity, the sort of things that moved me in that direction, and also why that forced me to think about the relationship between science and faith. But I'm going to talk about ways of thinking about this relationship. How, how can you create space for science in Christianity? How can you create space for Christianity in science? And then finally, I'm going to pick up on this theme which I think is very important, which is whether religious belief actually is irrational. Does it kind of way violate the norms of rational discourse? And what I hope to do is open up some really interesting questions. Obviously, we do have time limits. We'll have Q&A afterwards, so hopefully we'll be able to move things along in directions you want to. But it is a big topic, and I'm just delighted to be here to be able to open these questions up for you. So let me begin just by setting the background. I am Irish, um, I grew up in Northern Ireland at the time when um, basically what we euphemistically call the Troubles were just beginning. And so for me, as I saw Northern Ireland becoming very heavily politicised and polarised along religious lines, it just seemed to me obvious that in effect if there was no religion, there'd be no religious violence, the world would be a better place. And that was really I think a very important contributing cause to my early atheism. I mean, you all know the story, I guess, about the Englishman who went to Belfast on one of its livelier nights. And as he went back to his hotel rather late at night, unwisely, he found himself confronted by a gang of youth with baseball bats. And they forced him against the wall and they said, Are you a Catholic or are you a Protestant? Now, the guy realized that the answer he gave to that question might be significant. So, he had a stroke of genius. He said, I'm an atheist. There was a little pause. Then he said, I'm a Protestant atheist. <laughs> but actually, that wasn't the real thing that moved me towards atheism. It was something else. It was science. Because at, sci at school, science was really the thing I loved. I did double maths and physics and chemistry to A-level, and basically for me, science was not simply my future, it was my love. And really for me, science was something that uh, explained our world, that really gave me a lot of intellectual energy. And it seemed to me to be very, very obvious that simply science eroded the conceptual space that once was occupied by God. And not only can I see no way in which you could, in effect, bring God back into that way of things. It just seemed to me that God had been left behind altogether. And therefore, for me, the future was bound to be atheistic, and I tended to regard those around me who did believe in God um, to be either mad or bad or sad, or actually possibly all three. Um, and I know it sounds a bit arrogant, but I'm just being very honest with you and saying this is the way I felt at the time. The main driver was simply science. The love of science meant the rejection of anything that seemed to get in its way or to take its place. 
So that really was where I was coming from. And obviously I then um, had to figure out what to do, so I went to Oxford to study chemistry as an undergraduate. As you know, Oxford is like a different system, so I still spent four years studying nothing but chemistry, and then moved on to do a, a doctorate in sort of way more biological sciences, looking at physical ways of investigating biological systems. I have to say, I did not expect Oxford to change me in another way. Uh, I expected uh, my time at Oxford to reinforce my atheism and, of course, to develop my understanding of thinking about science. And it certainly did that in relation to science, but it didn't do the first of those things. Because I began to realize, I think, that atheism was perhaps rather less robust intellectually than I had thought it was. I began to realize also that perhaps, perhaps I'd misread what Christianity was all about and began to rethink its, its, its essence, what it was all about, and the kind of things that basically would have made me once move away from it, but now might make me think about it more clearly. And so this is a line from C.S. Lewis. I wasn't reading C.S. Lewis around the time that I shifted from atheism to Christianity, but this little quote from a lecture C.S. Lewis gave in Oxford back in 1945, I think puts, puts his finger on what it was that really drew me to Christianity. It was an intellectual conversion. Lewis writes these words, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And what Lewis is doing is a very visual thinker, is to ask us to imagine, um, for example, you're out at night, uh, it's coming towards dawn, you're on a hilltop, and as the sun rises, the shadows gradually disappear, you see things more clearly, the mist burns off, and you see things as they really are. I'm sure there are patches of mist remaining, shadows, but you see more clearly. <coughs> And that, for me, was really one of the things that Christianity articulated. This way of seeing things, this, this capacious vision of what the world was all about, what life was all about. And I found that intellectually very, very exciting. Also troublesome, because, of course, I had to then rethink the question of where science came into all of this. But I think it helps us to begin to reflect on what it is that Christianity might bring that isn't always there in science, indeed, if it's at all. So here's a Spanish philosopher that I discovered about 25 years ago who still interests me. And this is Jorge Ortega reflecting on, on what we need as human beings. And the point he's trying to make is that as human beings, it's not enough to understand how the world functions. We want to figure out what it means and what we mean. In other words, he's saying it's not enough to know how things work. We do want to know what they mean. And so he begins by making what I think is a very good point about science. It really is great. Scientific truth, he writes, is characterized by its precision and the certainty of its predictions. But science achieves these admirable qualities at the cost of remaining on the level of secondary concerns, leaving ultimate and decisive questions untouched. And he's getting there at this idea of ultimate questions. Those of you who've read the philosophy of science, this is Karl Popper. The idea that there are these big questions like, do we really matter? Why are we here? Why is there a world which Popper says science can't really answer, but these questions matter to us? And he goes on, just says, these things keep bubbling up within us. We're given no escape from ultimate questions. In one way or another, they're in us, whether we like it or not. Scientific truth is exact, but it is incomplete. And that's something I began to reflect on, in effect saying, look, what if it's not that science determines reality? It's much more that there's a reality that's bigger than science, and in effect, you might think of there being a big picture. Maybe science fills in part of this big picture, and that's great. But there's more that needs to be said. And maybe science isn't so good at that. And in many ways, that was the kind of way of thinking which I was beginning to develop as I thought these things through. And of course, this is really about the quest 
for meaning. And this is something I think many of you reflect on. Uh, and basically, it, 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 meaning is not something empirical. You can't read it off. You know, it is something which is about an interpretation of our world, but it satisfies, it engages those deeper existential questions which go on just beneath the surface. And actually, this isn't a specifically religious issue at all. I've never thought that Jeanette Winston is a particularly religious person, but in a recent book, which I think has the most wonderful title, I wish I could give a title like that, Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal? But in this book, Look at what she says. We simply cannot eat, sleep, hunt, and reproduce. We are meaning-seeking creatures. In other words, we're looking for something that helps us to understand a bigger picture, how we fit into things, not simply how life works, but what life means. And Winston, in the book, simply says, look, unless you figure this one out, you are going to be dissatisfied. You're going to be wandering along a sort of uncharted world. There's a need to try and sort this thing out. Why is this so important? I mean, as those of you who are psychologists will know, there's a huge literature on this about why meaning is so important to us and why when we believe we find meaning, it really makes a difference. For example, meaning is about, look at this, the extent to which we comprehend, make sense of, or see significance in lives, accompanied by the degree to which they perceive themselves to have a purpose, mission, or overarching aim in life. And you've all thought about that. I mean, that's part of what it means to be a human. And for me, one of the difficulties is that science can't actually decisively answer those questions. I mentioned psychology a moment ago. Psychology is very, very good at saying this matters to people. It's very good at saying here are the kind of things that people find meaningful. But saying this is what life means, that's not something it does. So it does, I think, raise some very interesting questions. But we can, I think, begin to unpack this a little bit more. Look at the dimensions of meaning. And again, this is something very significant, I think, for all of us. That in effect, these are the kind of, the kind of organizing features, the central themes, which kind of way gets gathered together in that simple English word meaning. First of all, you know, the question of identity. You know, again, many of us are still thinking about this. Purpose. You know, that is important for each of us. Many of you are thinking about that. What am I meant to be doing? It's a deep question. That's more importantly, can I make a difference? And of course, for many people, a very deep question. Do I actually matter? That's a really important question. And that's why something which begins to say, here is a way of looking at the world, which gives you this big picture, which in effect helps you to make sense of who you are and why you matter, is really very important to a lot of people. And I found this. Um, in Christianity, I did not really find it in atheism, although many atheists would say that perhaps you can give atheist responses to each of these, but I have to say I did not find them at the time, and since then I haven't really found those responses I've heard particularly persuasive, but I will come back to that later. So the point I'm trying to make really is this, this is from the and his colleagues, uh, Roy Barmeister, a well-known social psychologist, just in effect saying empirically, this is what people seem to be worried about. So basically, I've talked a little bit about this transition from Christianity, from atheism to Christianity. But really what I want to talk about is this second theme. And I guess that's probably why many of you are here tonight. It's because you're trying to figure out, uh, irrespective of whether you're a faith commitment or not, how you might be able to relate science and faith. And certainly, in my teenage years, when I was studying science in high school, I mean, I was into the warfare model in a very big way. That, in effect, they were basically inextricably opposed, that they were irremediably opposed, that, in effect, there was simply a complete contrast between them. And, it, so to speak, if there is warfare between science and religion, a scientist who takes religion seriously, or a religious believer who takes science seriously, in effect, are, by definition, traitors. So it is a very strong cultural um, feeling that science and religion are at war, 
But I hate to say to you that actually this is not really something that scholarship has endorsed. It tends to be repeated in the media simply by repetition rather than by any evidential base. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. But it seems to me that there are several ways in which we can begin to think about how we relate science and faith. I'm going to explore two with you tonight. And again, I want to emphasize what I'm doing is saying, look, here are two approaches I find helpful. Do they help you in any way as well? Do they kind of give you an imaginative stimulus? These are quite visual ways of thinking about how these might be held together. And the two approaches I'm going to adopt are ones that I doubt it will surprise you very much. First of all, science and faith offer different perspectives on ourselves and our world. And secondly, science and faith engage with ourselves and our world at different levels. Now, if you're a philosopher of science like uh, Ronald Gear, who adopts a kind of perspectival approach to questions of meaning and so on, I mean, Gear would say that actually in, in, you can say these are two sides of the same coin. That in effect, perspective is a rich spatial image which includes the possibility of levels. But for our purpose tonight, I'm just going to say let's think about them as being different because they're helpful in beginning to open these things up. So let me talk to you about Charles Coulson. Um, Coulson uh, studied physics and mathematics here at Cambridge. Um, he wrote a paper as an undergraduate. He was a very, very able person. Ended up as our first professor of theoretical chemistry at Oxford before he died of cancer at the age of 74. And I put him on the screen, actually showing his photograph for several reasons. One of them is that actually um, Coulson helped me to think these things through. Coulson was um, basically best known for a book called Science Christian Belief, which is still worth reading. And he has this fundamental idea we do not talk about a god of the gaps. So actually, it is not that we're talking about things that science cannot explain. In many ways, Coulson's point is we need a meta-theory which explains why science explains in the first place. In other words, we need a way of thinking, if you like, a big picture, which helps us to accommodate the fact that science works so well. And Coulson, in effect, felt he had found a way of looking at this through this idea of perspectives. And his argument, Coulson was a well-known Methodist lay preacher as well as being a professor at Oxford, he argued that Christianity provides an explanatory vision that explains the success of science. So I was at Oxford studying chemistry as an undergraduate at Wadham College. Coulson's chair was based at Wadham College. And by a happy accident, I suppose, Coulson preached in the college chapel about how he held his science and his faith together. And in many ways, what I'm outlining to you now is the substance of what he said in that sermon. Stay with me, although I've now moved beyond it slightly. Nevertheless, you all have to start somewhere. And Coulson's framework really seemed very helpful to me. And Coulson's argument is basically that reality is complex, it's like a vast building, and you see it from one angle, you see it from a different angle, they are not the same, but the whole is more than the sum of those parts. And therefore, to give a good account of a complex reality, you cannot simply limit yourself to one angle of approach to, this is the way it looks from this angle, you've got to try and survey the whole thing from those different perspectives. Now, Coulson um, basically was a mountaineer. Um, he spent some time during the Second World War as a lecturer in Dundee, and Ben Nevis, there rarely seen on a good day, I have to say, uh, was one of the mountains he climbed. And he used this as an analogy. The point he's making is that uh, Ben Nevis looks very different from the west, the east, the north, and the south, but it is the same mountain. It's complex, it's big. And therefore, to give a full account of this, you need to bring together these different perspectives and say, Ben never says, each of these, and one on its own, is not enough. And so the point he's making, to quote him, is that a partial knowledge, in other words, the way things look at from one perspective, can be supplemented by sharing with others 
in the descriptions which we give us. And it's the man, Coulson Bearmind, who's writing back in the 1950s, who cannot or will not look at it from more than one viewpoint, who claims an exclusive authority for his own position. And Coulson there is hinting at what he regards as uh, kind of way the arrogance on some part, some, not all, just some, or his fellow scientists who would say, well, the scientific perspective is the only perspective. And Coulson is saying, no, we need a deeper and richer vision. And one of the points that Coulson makes is we need some way of bringing together observation of our world and deeper reflection on what it means. In other words, supplementing the cognitive with the existential. Those deeper questions, how things work, but also what they mean. And so Coulson felt that this perspectival approach was quite helpful. And I think it is. You can amplify it imaginatively and conceptually. I mentioned Ron Gear. You can give others who add to that. But let me change voice and introduce you to Mary Midgley, um, who is one of Britain's most interesting philosophers, quite a formidable person, one of a group of women philosophers at Oxford in the 1940s, people like Philippa Foote and uh, Iris Murdoch. And in her recent writings, this whole question of science and existentialism and meaning and faith really have been right at the fore of her writing. And Mitchley writes this, and I think this is actually quite a perceptive comment. I think it's also very neatly phrased. She says, for most important questions in human life, a number of different conceptual toolboxes always have to be used together. And the point that she's making is that, you know, to use perspectival approach, one perspective doesn't deliver all you need. But she's also making the point that different intellectual disciplines use different methodologies, different toolboxes. And to explain or engage something really complex, you are going to need these multiple approaches. The danger is you simply limit yourself to one approach, and by doing so you reduce and inevitably, I'm afraid, distort what you're looking at. So she argues that we need multiple maps of reality. Again, it's a very useful image. I think it actually helps us to think about these things quite persuasively. Uh, making the point that none of these is good enough on its own. And we might stay with that image of a map. Because in many ways what uh, Mitchley is saying is think of maps being overlaid on a landscape. In effect, disclosing its different dimensions, its different facets. To give you uh, an obvious example, you might think of um, Julius Caesar crossing the River Rubicon you know, in, in BC 54, whatever it was. I mean, you could easily give a physical map of that. Here's a map of Italy, there's the River Rubicon, we're halfway down, and so you could easily understand the topography as Caesar led an army south and crossed over the Rubicon, heading on his way to Rome. So you give an account based on the geography of the region. But that is not why we remember Caesar and the Rubicon. It's because there's also a political map of meaning that has to be laid over this event as well. The Rubicon marked a boundary between Roman territories and the area north of them. So by crossing this river, Caesar was actually declaring war against Rome. So the point that Midgley is making is to really bring out the richness, the depth of things, we do need multiple maps. And she gives us another analogy, it's one that I think is quite helpful, the analogy of an aquarium. She's asking us to visualize a very large aquarium. And she wants to try and make the point that one angle of approach isn't good enough. So she says, look, we can't see it as a whole from above, so we peer. That's a nice word, peer. You know, we sort of look hard. We, we don't see fully. We're, we're kind of squinting our eyes, trying to see something through a number of small windows. We can eventually make quite a lot of sense of this habitat if we patiently put together the data from different angles. But if we insist that our own window is the only one worth looking through, then we shan't 
get very far. And her point, really, from a philosophical perspective, is that we need to develop ways of approaching complex realities, whether they are the world in which we live or ourselves as human beings, which are attentive and responsive to their complexity. It's dead easy to be simple, but simplification is so often simply distortion and erosion of the richness of what we're looking at. So mixture there, I think, is helping us in some ways. This idea of multiple perspectives. Again, think of that analogy of a big picture. Maybe science fills in part of that picture, and that is great. But maybe there are other possible sources of knowledge, meaning, value, and we need to bring those in as well. And I guess in many ways the question is that's really lingering here, that's really floating in the air, is whether, as human beings, we can exist with a way of thinking which doesn't engage those deeper questions of identity, purpose, value, and, of course, the deeper question of meaning. So that is thinking about this from perspectives. But, of course, we can also think about this in terms of levels. And levels of meaning, levels of interpretation is a very simple idea. Those of you who are scientists are probably perfectly well used to this already. You think about the way which an electron is represented in physics and chemistry and biology. It's the same electron, but it is treated in quite different ways, depending on the purposes of these disciplines. And so one of the points I want to make is we can begin to say that perhaps we think about Science explaining things at one level, and maybe faith at another. You know, in other words, there is room for amplification. That, in effect, when we're talking about things happening, for example, we don't simply talk about one level of causation. We, in effect, bring several together. And that's an interesting idea, and it needs an analogy to make it work. So here's an analogy devised back in the 1960s by Frank Rhodes, uh, Rhodes uh, was a British geologist who went on to become president of Cornell University during the 1990s. And again, he's reflecting on this question. You know, how do we, in effect, think about the complexity of our world? And the answer he suggests is to think of different levels. And the analogy he gives is putting a kettle on the boil. And uh, it's a charming analogy, if I give you its full context, it's a kettle being placed on a gas spring in a laboratory. So you can imagine you know, how far back that takes you. But here's the point he's going to make. Question, why is that kettle boiling? Answer, because the gas is burning, and therefore chemical energy is being to heat, and therefore raises the water to its boiling point, and that is why the kettle is boiling. Rhodes says there's a second answer, which is this. The kettle is boiling because I wanted to make myself a cup of tea. Now, here's the point that Rhodes is trying to make. Listen carefully. Does answer one, which is right, mean answer two cannot be right? Because there can only be one answer to this question. Does the fact that answer two is right, making a cup of tea, mean that answer number one can't be right. No. These two taken together give you a fuller picture of what is going on. Well, I want to suggest to you is that we need that fuller picture, that big picture, if you like, to try and make sense of life and live meaningfully in this world. And that certainly is something that I think is a really important theme to explore. And we could open up other questions for discussion. This is Peter Medwer. Peter Medwer, as you know, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for his work in immunobiology. And Medwer uh, was what I would describe as an old-fashioned rationalist. Um, he died in the 1980s, and his final book was called The Limits of Science. And in effect, in this book, Medwer was saying, you know, as someone who loves science, and who doesn't like metaphysics and doesn't like religion at all, he's saying, I, I have to say, that there are some questions that science doesn't answer and isn't going to be able to answer. 
And he, he talks about these, and, and they're very, very similar to what Karl Popper calls ultimate questions. Medawar says there are questions that science cannot answer, and that no conceivable advance of science would empower it to answer. And in many ways, he's mapping out the question of meaning. He's mapping out questions of ethics. And he's simply saying that these are important questions. People are right to ask them. They're right to be concerned about them. But if science can't answer them, then you move on and look for answers somewhere else. Because we need answers to those questions to lead meaningful lives. So Metaphor there, I think, makes quite an important point. And what I'm really saying is that I, I, I love science. It, it, it remains one of my passions. But in saying that there is more that needs to be said, I hope you won't feel I'm dishonoring it. I'm simply loving it for what it is, not making it into something that is not. So let's look at a quote from Albert Einstein. This is a letter that um, Einstein wrote, a letter of condolence he wrote to uh, the family of Michele Besso. Besso was a friend of his from his Zurich days. Um, and um, what Einstein says here may puzzle you. Um, he says, look, Michele, he's been part of the strange world a little ahead of me, but that means nothing. For believing physicists like us know that the distinction between past, present, and future has only the meaning of a persistent illusion. Now, those of you who are physicists will know what he's getting at. You, know, you have these um, world lines that move from one to another, and at this point, you know, you're here, at that point, you're not here, but it, it's just physics. And I often wonder what this poor man's family thought when they received this letter, because it, 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 it didn't actually make complete sense to them, I think. But interestingly, Rudolf Kahner, uh, many of you know from the Vienna Circle, got to know Einstein around this time at Princeton, and said, look, that this man really worried about this. It's reflected in that letter. He said, look, the problem of now, in other words, us being here right now and thinking that our lives and lifetimes are significant, meant something special for, let's say, people. Something different from the past and the future, but this important difference doesn't and can't occur within physics. Einstein's thought that these scientific descriptions cannot possibly satisfy our human needs, that there is something essential about the now, which is just outside the realm of science. And again, that's interesting. In some of his later writings, Einstein, again, praising science, left, right, and center, but just saying, we need to say more. It's not a contradiction, but in supplementation. And we're looking at the deep questions like ethics, but above all, those questions of meaning. So let's look then at a question which I think is important. I touched on this, but haven't engaged it. Because many of you were saying, well, look, you know, what you're saying is very well, but surely science and religion are locked in conflict. And therefore, there is simply no possibility of any kind of interesting engagement or indeed the possibility of somebody meaningfully being both a religious believer and an active scientist. Now, I think one thing that I would want to say is that lots of people who do this, so actually, whether you think it's intellectually viable or not, there are people who really do hold these things together. But I think we need to raise a question mark about whether this way of thinking about the relation of science and religion actually can be sustained. Sure, it's there in the media, left, right, and center, but its evidential basis is weak. It's a recent development. Historians looking at the origins of this, the kind of um, genealogy of this, would say it really begins to emerge in the 1870s, which actually is surprisingly late. Um, and it very often is linked with American writers, and then kind of gets picked up in the United Kingdom as well. But you find this defended in Peter, Har uh, Peter uh, criticized Peter Harrison's book, The Territories of Science and Religion. And then if you want to think about this, that really is the book to go to, because in effect, that is what scholarship is. And Harrison's point simply is science is one thing, religion is another thing. They have been understood in different ways down the ages. Their relationship is not essential. In other words, if there's something called science, which is always the same, something called religion, which is always the same, we have here a changing relationship 
which depends on a whole range of things. And of course, Harrison makes the point, for example, in the Renaissance, you have a much more positive interaction. The idea, for example, you know, of the two books, the book of scripture, the book of nature, which you can read together. One adds depth at one level, the other at another. So I think we need to look then at one of the classic examples of this, which is Christopher Hitchens' book, and God is not great. One of the manifestos, so to speak, of the new atheism published in 2007. Now I know this is kind of way fading away very, very quickly, but I still want to look at this because it seems to me it's very important as we think about the rationality of faith. And Hitchens chooses as an example, as those of you who have read this book will know, smallpox vaccination. And he makes a point which is historically absolutely correct. This is right. He writes that the Christian writer, Timothy Dwight, who was president of Yale College, later of course Yale University, opposed smallpox vaccination on religious grounds. And that is right, okay? No dispute. The issue is whether this determines the big picture. And Hitchens says it does. In other words, you take a single event and you say that's a universal pattern. <coughs> religious people are opposed to science. Atheists. Love it. It's not that simple. I think you all know that. But let's just give you two additional examples. I'm afraid neither of these appear in Hitchens' narrative, but they ought to have. Um, the Christian writer, Jonathan Edwards, very well known theologian, look at the previous generation, president of Princeton College, approved of smallpox vaccination. In fact, he approved of it so much, he asked to be vaccinated to show his students at Princeton that it was absolutely safe. And he was dead a week later. <laughs> now, I mean, <laughs> if you tell the full story, I think you ought to include this. There's a religious person who thought small pack vaccination, right? It's a complex picture. And you just can't reduce it to single case studies which are determined. This kind of golden thread approach to history we simply cherry pick what you like, as if that somehow disclosed the universal picture. And here's another one. This is from much more recent. This is George Bernard Shaw, which knows an atheist. He also opposed smallpox vaccination. He said it was a delusion. He was very, very rude about Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister. He said all sorts of things about which I would repeat. But basically, he was saying, don't do it. Smallpox vaccination is to be resisted. An atheist in the 20th century. No, I'm not saying anything rude about atheism. I'm just saying, look at the picture. It's complicated. And you can't just reduce this to simple little slogans. And in many ways, that's one of my concerns about the new atheism. But it does bring me neatly on to the final topic I want to look at, which is this. Is religious faith irrational? And of course, this was a, a leading theme of this movement we call new atheism. Uh, Richard Dawkins is a very good example, Christopher Hitchens. I'm going to talk a bit about Hawkins because I, I think he is the best of the school writers and certainly the most interesting. And I want to look at some of the issues he raises uh, and interact with them. Now, as many of you will know, um, New Atheism is beginning to fade away, but nevertheless, it, it still lingers. People still talk about the questions it raises, and rightly so, because they are important questions. Those who are kind of a neutral observers of this debate suggest there are three criticism that could be made of New Atheism. Um, first of all, um, New Atheism very often criticizes ideas of God, which, for example, bear a little relationship to those associated with Christianity. It tends to be a sort of caricature of um, uh, Christian ideas and other ideas from other religions. Secondly, it offers hopelessly oversimplified accounts of religion, like the warfare narrative, without indicating these views are no longer taken seriously by academic scholarship. And of course, the third point, I think, is the most interesting, uh, and it's this, this is the third point, that the new atheism applies very severe criteria of judgment to other people's beliefs, but doesn't apply it to its own beliefs. Now, you know, I, I'm all for you know, saying, if you are going to believe something, you need to be able to meet these epistemic standards. I'm all for that. It's just if I say that about you, then to be epistemically virtuous, I have to apply exactly the same criteria to my own beliefs. 
That's not really something we find in the New Atheism. So those are concerns, but let's move on and look straight away at Richard Dawkins, who raises this very fundamental concern. In effect, that faith is about a principal disengagement from rational thinking. It's a refusal to engage with evidence. Look at this with very good sunlight. Faith means blind trust in the absence of evidence, even in the teeth of evidence. And uh, one of the things New Atheism is very good at slogans. They, they really are nice sunlights that kind of really stick in your head. Or again, faith is a kind of mental illness. Now, that he wrote in the second edition of Selfish Gene, I think he was very unwise to say that, but then if you read that book, uh, you'll find it there. Um, I think Dawkins clearly feels that faith is dysfunctional, that there is no evidential basis for it, and therefore it needs to be critiqued. And of course, he's perfectly right to raise these questions, but I'm not sure he's quite understood what it's all about. Also, there are questions about whether the position in science is quite as straightforward as Dawkins suggests. Again, this was selfish gene. Some of you will know this passage. He writes, faith is a state of mind that leads people to believe something, it doesn't matter what, in the total absence of supporting evidence. If there were good supporting evidence, then faith would be superfluous, for the evidence would compel us to believe it anyway. That's a very positivist view of science. But I would, I think, want to raise questions about actually how reliable this is. Look at the third line down. I want to suggest there's a very important distinction between the total absence of supporting evidence, okay? And listen very carefully. The absence of totally supporting evidence. Again, they're not the same thing. The total absence of supporting evidence, Dawkins phrase, but in the real life, the absence of totally supporting evidence. Because that means, as those of your scientists will know, very often you have to say there are several theoretical options and the evidence compels us to none of them. And therefore we have to ask what criteria like simplicity or elegance or productiveness or comprehensiveness and so on, shall be used in trying to infer which of these is the best explanation. It's rarely a knockdown argument. It's much more weighing evidential possibilities. And of course, there are many cases where in scientific evidence is born of several outcomes. Um, proof, I think, is really the mathematics and logic. But you think of big debates in the sciences, single universe versus multiverse. I mean, you know, the jury's out on that one. It's going to be out for a very long time, I think, because the evidence is not totally supportive. And I have distinguished colleagues at Oxford, I'm sure you have here at Cambridge, who in effect will quite happily take one of these two positions and say something like this. We believe the multiverse is the better hypothesis for the following reasons. And we believe we are right in holding that position in brackets but we can't prove it's right, those brackets. And that is not inconsistent. That's just the way science is. That very often the theories are underdetermined by the evidence. And so you have to make a judgment as to which of these theories might be the best, knowing that that judgment may change over time, for example, as more evidence accumulates. And you might think, for example, of cases, very exciting cases, where science does change its mind about things. And I would suggest a very good example would be cosmology. And if we were to be here 100 years ago, okay, uh, and I was talking to you about the origins of the universe, well, I wouldn't be, I couldn't be, because at that time, nobody thought the universe had a beginning. It was basically not a scientifically serious notion. And of course, things have changed radically. And I think that's a very significant about turn. Um, it's very often said you know, that scientific advance entails religious retreat, but that, I think, may be true in some cases, but certainly not true in all cases. Because the religious language of creation might not have meant very much to scientists back in, say, 1918, now, the question is, what's the relationship between origination and creation? It's moved on. But the point I'm trying to make 
is that scientists have to make judgments about what the best explanation of the evidence actually is. But I want to take Dawkins very seriously. I disagree with them, but I respect him. I don't take him seriously. Surely he is right to say that we need to provide reasons for our beliefs. I, I see nothing to quarrel with that. You have to go say, I believe this for the following reasons. You might not be able to prove it absolutely, but you should be able to justify it by saying, for this reason, for this reason. In other words, I thought this one through. But I think, again, I'm just putting this forward for your consideration, I think Dawkins is wrong to think we can prove everything we believe. And I'm going to explore that with you because I think it is such an important point. That actually I do welcome the very strong statement that we should only believe things that can be absolutely proven to be true. But the difficulty is that proves to be a very small world. And it's not one actually that many of us would feel we could inhabit meaningfully. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. So let me again go back to Oxford. This is for Isaiah Berlin. Very interesting writer, a historian of ideas, a philosopher, and in many of his writings he looks at the kind of things that human beings believe. And he says, look, these beliefs we have fall under three broad categories. And that's quite simple. Um, basically, those you can prove by science, those you can prove by logic, and those you can't prove in either of those ways. So it's, it's actually quite an easy distinction to follow. Here's the point he makes. And again, this is something for your consideration. You may feel he's wrong, but this is certainly an interesting point to reflect on. <coughs> Ideas about moral values. For example, it's wrong to rape. Oppression is bad. Liberty is good. Beliefs about there being a God, there not being a God. Social values. Berlin's point is very simple. Those all belong in that third category. That's just the way things are. We've got to get used to it. The beliefs that really matter in life can't be proved in that hard, 100% way. And the point that Berlin really is making is, look, there are certain shallow truths that maybe you can prove, but those aren't existentially satisfying. You need something more than that. And basically, there are loads of writers who make this point. This is just the way things are. It's not problematic. Get used to it. Terry Eagleton is a very good example. He writes rather well. There it is. Um, we hold many beliefs that have no unimpeachably rational justification, but are nonetheless reasonable to entertain. And that really is just his summary of not a philosophical position, but just an observation about the way life is. So let's do a little thought experiment. I want you to just Think about this, okay? So it's, it's playing around. I want you to imagine you would only accept ideas that can be conclusively and decisively proved to be right. I want to ask, what sort of world would that be? And, I mean, I, here are some thoughts from me. I can prove that to you make four. I can prove the whole, providing this fellow right. It's greater than the part. I think also you could say the chemical formula of water is H2O, but those of your chemists will say the reason it's interesting is not because of H2O, because of hydrogen bonding, fantastic forces, but nevertheless, I think all of those are right. They may be incomplete in some ways, but nevertheless, they are right. But I'm just not sure that gives you a reason to get up in the morning. You know, you just need a bit more than that. Because here are some things I don't think you could believe. And again, you know, this is very much me just uh, provoking you a bit, you know. I don't think you could accept any of these, any moral, political, or religious ideas. Because those are about judgments. Those are about, in effect, interpretations. I don't think you could say life has a meaning, and the meaning is this. Whatever it is, beyond the evidence. Any notion of what is good or bad back to that. And of course, there is a God, or there's not a God. Because one of the paradoxes, which I'll talk about in a moment, is that um, actually both of those positions lie beyond proof. It's largely a matter of judgment. So there are issues there to think about. Um, here is Stan Alex Rosenberg, uh, a very interesting book, The Atheist Guide to Reality. Those who are atheists, I would say immediately that actually the position that he sets out here, I don't think is typical. I'm quoting it because it seems to me to be very problematic. I'm not saying 
all atheists accept this. Please understand that. But this is what he says. I think it's very interesting because he is, in effect, adopting what we might call a form of scientism. That, in effect, you limit yourself to what the natural sciences can show to be right. And so here are his answers to some questions. Uh, is there a God? No. Again, because science does not show that. What's the nature of reality? What physics says it is. What's the purpose of the universe? There is none. What's the meaning of life? Ditto. Now, here is this one. And it's this point where I think you begin to get a look at What's the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? Rosenberg's reply is that there is no moral difference between them. The books, uh, you can get the book on, on Google and have a look at yourself. Here's what I had hoped he might say. Uh, when I was reading this book, I thought, I think I've misread this. I think what he wrote ought to have been, look at the fine few lines, science is unable to discern a moral difference between them, comma, but nevertheless we can, we can figure this out in other ways. But that's what he actually says. And I just feel that is very inadequate. So in many ways I'm raising a question there about the reliability of this. But the main point I want to make simply is not to criticize Rosenberg. The point I'm trying to make is that we are human beings. And we have to face up to the epistemic problems we face. And one of them is that these beliefs that really matter, the ones that give direction and purpose to our lives, in the end lie beyond absolute proof. But that is not a problem. And one of the reasons why we've seen this massive shift from modernity to postmodernity, which we could spend a lot of time talking about, is that people have begun to realize that actually these things are not as straightforward as we once thought. But that does not entail absolute relativism. It simply means realizing that we can give good reasons for what we believe, but nonetheless may not be able to prove them. And that does not stop us from holding those beliefs. It may seem to be irrational to believe any moral belief. It may seem to be irrational to believe anything political, but actually, that's the way we function as human beings. And that seems to me to be really important. Faith is just the way things are. It's not something odd. So the question of meaning, again, I opened with this, I'm coming back to this. It's about realizing, I think, you cannot read meaning off from nature. It's about the interpretation of reality. In other words, it's a judgment, not something that can absolutely be proved. So let me end with a quote from Bertrand Russell. I like Bertrand Russell. Uh, he writes very elegantly. And this is a quote I read when I was about 16 years old. It's from the opening pages of his History of Western Philosophy. And I found it arresting. And I didn't agree with it. Remember, I was then in a sort of very naive, positivist, atheist phase. You, you believe what you prove, can't you? you can't prove it, it's wrong. And that phrase from Bertrand Russell really puzzled me. Philosophy helps us to live with uncertainty and yet without being paralyzed by hesitation. The point that Russell was making, I mean, most people will be able to see it immediately, is that actually um, there is a very limited number of things we can be certain about. And there are an awful lot of important things that we can't prove to be right. Yet, we can give good reasons for those and lead a meaningful life. So here's what is the interesting point to me. I, I, I don't, a young man just felt that Russell had missed something here. Now I think actually he really needs to take him very, very seriously. Russell allowed himself to be described as an atheist, quote, in the popular sense of the term. But in his philosophical writings, he always made it clear he was an epistemological agnostic. In other words, he could not, in effect, show either that there was a God or that there was not a God. And therefore, in effect, he decided that he would, in effect, make a lifestyle choice and live as an atheist. But intellectually, he had not resolved that. And the point I'm simply trying to make is that that position, you may say, is irrational. I don't think it is. I think it's a recognition of the difficulties we face. So for me, one of the points I, I'm not saying oh, all beliefs are equally good. I mean, you've got to check these things out. But I'm going to suggest something that may strike you as being challenging. 
you know, very often the New Atheist portrays religion as kind of the exception to the rule. It's irrational against the pattern of human rational thought. What I'm wondering is actually whether religion might be the pattern. That actually, we believe things that really, really matter to us, knowing we can't prove them, but also believing that we can trust them. So it seems to me there's a very interesting dialogue. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to wrap up. What I've tried to do in this lecture is not answer these massive questions, but rather just begin to open them up and tell you about some of the things that I have found interesting. If you're asking me um, about this whole question of science and faith, in my view, in my experience, and I'm not claiming any privilege here, that in effect for me, it's not that the Christian faith makes my science less meaningful or less wonderful. Those of you who have read Richard Dawkins' book, um, Unweaving the Rainbow, will know he takes the view that if you're a religious person, that kind of way impoverishes your appreciation of the natural world. I have to say, my own experience is quite the reverse. I'll explain why as I end. And that's because Christianity gives me this lens, this way of looking at the world. So I see it not simply as an extremely interesting world, but a world that in some ways, to some extent, shows something of the nature of God, like Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And actually that gives me an increased motivation to want to study nature, but it also means I pay close attention to it. I appreciate its complexity. I appreciate its beauty, because the beauty of nature is a pointer to something even more important, at least in the way I see things. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been extraordinarily patient with the audience. What I'm going to do is wrap up here and thank you for your patience. We are going to have a time of questions and answer. And um, the way we're going to do this, if this is all right, is we have a microphone, I think. Uh, yes, we have a microphone. And I'm going to suggest we take, say, four or five questions. We'll just, just go around and take four or five questions, and you write them down, and then I'll begin to answer those. If you've got time, we'll do another set as well. So if you'd like to ask a question, hands up and we'll get the microphone around you to speak clearly to the microphone so I can write it down, and then I will answer these questions. So, off we go. Well, there's one just in the back there. Um, I really enjoyed the lecture. It's amazing. Um, but I feel like you're, what you say is disproving the atheism in the sense, rather than giving the bridging that gap from social science to religion, as in, why must there be a religion filling that gap that we the science can sort of cover? And if there is religion, why does it have to be monotheism? Why does it have to be Christianity? Why does it have to be the branch of Christianity? To what extent is it literal Bible definition? Right, we're off to a great start. I've written that down. Thank you. That's a long question. It's really good. Right, let's take a look few of them until we get cracking, okay? Hands up so we can make sure we get these. Hello. Um, I am I, I atheist. Um, my question um, is, I, I feel like the, the way you sort of portrayed atheistic thought was that you sort of say this idea about if you can't prove it, toss it out the window. Um, I, per, I personally don't know many atheists who, who would take that view. Um, I think, you know, you, I agree if you, if you go around thinking that the only, the only things worth believing are those things that you categorically you don't have much left. Um, I, perhaps a more apt way of putting it would be to say that it's, it's just about evidence. It's about that there isn't any real compelling evidence for God's existence. And so in the same way that you, know, you can't disprove, you can't prove that fairies don't exist, but there's no real compelling evidence for fairies existing. So perhaps if you could maybe offer some more kind of compelling sure. evidence for God's existence. And, sure. But thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a long way. <laughs> if I may, uh, I have a slight question about religion was given as only a lens, but not as a source of prediction. And the biggest contributor to the myth that science and religion are incompatible is the fact that some religions have made predictions that were provably wrong 
and some are Excel data that the uh, uh, the Hebrew scholars even have a word for renovating or shall we say retouching those principles. I can understand that science is happy to adapt whenever there is evidence to the contrary, whenever one of its, shall we say, beliefs or theories is provably wrong, it, ad it adopts a different one. What does religion do? More specifically, what does Christianity do in those cases? And how will it adapt if some of our knowledge that we hold today, even scientific knowledge, is proven wrong? Thank you. That's really useful for a long time. It's great. Let's take one more, and then we'll start answering. So, uh, Catherine is running around, she's very noble of her. One more, and then we'll give her a break, and while I answer the rest of this. questions and if that meant it was invalid is acting as the foundation for a system of ethical beliefs. Great, we have four wonderful questions. So I mean that these actually open up lots of new things. So let's begin. Thank you very much indeed. So um, uh, let's let's uh, see where we start here. Um, I think that um, one of the issues here, let me just make sure I've read my notes properly. is um, that I focus perhaps too much on the new atheism. Now, I take that point, it's a fair point. Basically, it's still talked about, it's still influential. And actually, the question I'm talking about tonight is actually irritating. It's still discussed so often within the frame of the new atheism. And so in many ways, you know, I, I chose that way of approaching this simply because it did seem to be an obvious way of being to open this up. But you're right, that actually um, we need far more to th than that. And that, I think, is um, really a very important point to make. And you also um, indicate that perhaps I didn't really talk very much about Christianity. Actually, I didn't talk really generically. And again, um, that was because I want to open up some broad questions. But I'm very glad to have this opportunity just to talk about that in more detail. So again, your question might well be, well, you know, why, why Christianity, why not something else? Now, let me say, I, I, I'm. You know, I have no disrespect for other positions, but you, know, you have to choose one, don't you, really? And so I would explain uh, what I think, for me, really proves so important about Christianity. And I'll just, I'll just explain this, because I remember this very well. And here was this line of thought I had, okay? I had this idea, which I probably got from classical metaphysics, which is that God is a distant, impersonal being who exists in the far corners of the universe, and kind of way, isn't really very interested in us. And I, I thought, well, he's not interested in me, I'm not interested in him. You know, he's up there somewhere, I'm here in time and history and space. So, you know, what conceivable relevance could that distant God have to me? And then I began to think about this Christian idea of incarnation, which I really discovered probably while I was at Oxford. And um, as it was explained to me, uh, and as I would now, of course, develop it myself, it's this idea, and again, you know, I, I can't prove this is right, but it is a very distinctly Christian idea, which is that, in the words of John's Gospel, the Word became flesh, that actually God entered into our world and lived and dwelt among us. In other words, we are dealing with a God who made himself vulnerable, actually entered into our world, and therefore God can be known, not just known about and of course, you can develop this in a number of ways. One of the key things about incarnation is the link with suffering, that actually God knows what it's like to suffer. So these are actually very powerful ideas. And you're quite right to you know, make them much more specific, because that, that's clearly a very important thing to do. So if I was to try and explain why Christianity rather than something else, those would be some of the reasons I would give for actually um, that choice that I made. It wasn't just that it was kind of a, the, the nearest thing to hand. It was much more, there's something here which just seems to me to give me a sort of cognitive map to make sense of things, but also engage us some deep things like um, our vulnerability, our need for love, the reality of suffering. And for me, again, you know, it, 
this, this would take us off in a different direction, but I could talk about the question of suffering in a very vague philosophical way, so it's a very widely discussed thing. But actually for me, um, it's one thing to make intellectual sense of something. The real issue, I think, is how we cope with suffering. And just for me, Christianity gave that very powerful way of saying, Christ suffered, so if you suffer, see that in perspective. There's a lot more I need to say, but uh, I have three other very good questions to move on to. So let's move on to our second question, uh, which is the question of atheism and proof. And thank you for that. I mean, basically, um, the new atheists, I know, I, I, I'm assuming you're not one of them because you've articulated a position which sets you at some distance from them, about which I'm very pleased, I may say. Uh, the new atheists do take this position, and, and, and it, it, is, it is baffling. And I think it, I think it probably is because people like simple ideas and find more difficult ideas difficult to cope with. And certainly most atheists also, I gave the example of Bertrand Russell, but you could think of many, many others who actually would say, look, you know, we, we cannot prove things. The issue is, is there, an, is there compelling evidence for any worldview, you know, whether it's atheism or Christianity or whatever. In other words, what are the reasons that might force us to this? But I think it is more complex than simply a cognitive issue. I think with Thomas Nagel, who I, I admire very much as a philosopher, and he begins one of his discussions of this question by, by in effect, saying something which a psychologist would make perfect sense of. But I think philosophically it struck me as being a, an unwise thing to say, which is saying, look, I do not want there to be a God. I, I don't want to look at it, uh, which one it is, I, I have my notes back home. But he, he begins by articulating the wish and then, in effect, almost off to I the post hoc rationalization of the wish. And it's almost like foil back inverted, you know, in the sense that um, the, the, the wish is the desire to the thought. And I find that really very interesting. But you are right that many atheist philosophers would and do look at new atheists and say, that is just lightweight. That's not what we think. And I agree entirely. The difficulty is that very often, the debate is being conducted at a popular level with these very simplistic slogans. And actually, I, I find that really unsatisfying. Uh, one of the reasons why I mentioned Bertrand Russell is it seems to me Bertrand Russell represents a much more thoughtful position, which I find much more interesting, much more engaging, and one I certainly would be very happy to engage with. So thank you very much for making that point. Then I'll go back, sir, um, the very interesting question, which is um, prediction. And I think that that's a really interesting thing. And you also linked up the question of what we might call revisability. So let me try and address both of those questions. On the prediction front, I mean, I assume that when you talk about religions making predictions, you mean things like the end of the world, something like that. I mean, which are, I think are, are A, very unwise and also just, just pointless. But um, certainly there are those who can do this and clearly think that's important. I think you're also probably asking uh, an important philosophical question, which is, um, you know, if you think about a scientific theory, one of the questions we might ask is, can it predict something? And therefore, is that capacity to predict actually an indicator of its truth? I think that's a, that's a very interesting question. I think what I'd want to say is that um, I don't think religion really does predict. I think that if we, um, if we think of various theories of explanation, from, in, in my view, and again, there's something which we need further discussion. There are two major theories of scientific explanation at the moment, what we might usually call ontic explanations, what we might call epistemic explanations. Ontic explanations are about causality and things like that. Epistemic are much more about casting a conceptual net over things, which in effect establishes connections. You try and judge the, the net by its comprehensiveness and its capacity to bring together things which actually were once thought to be unrelated. For example, um, you might think of James Clark Maxwell here at Cambridge and the uh, unification of electricity and magnetism. And at least as I see things, I must stress I'm just talking in a purely personal capacity, um, religion falls into much more an epistemic approach. In other words, it's saying here is a conceptual net, a sort of way of looking at things you cast over observation and experiment, and it makes sense of things but it doesn't actually necessarily predict. And that, to me, is not necessarily a downside of things, because you know, if you read Charles Darwin, for example, his Origin of Species, you remember that one of his real concerns was he'd articulated a theory which, at least at that time, could not predict. But he felt that his explanatory capacity actually compensated for that. 
And of course, uh, you, will, you will know there's this massive debate about string theory. You know? I mean, what does string theory predict? Uh, can, you, can you falsify? These, these are really interesting questions. So I, I would certainly want to say, I don't think religion predicts, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. You then asked about revisability. I think, again, that's a really interesting question. Certainly, science revises its views when they seem to be wrong. For example, I mentioned the massive change in the cosmology of that century, and that's a very good example of science saying we need to move on. It also, I think, just reminds us that we, we cannot freeze the scientific enterprise and say that this is the way scientists think now, therefore, this is the way it is, this is right. It's just the way we think at the moment. It may be the stays the way we think, but it might also be subject to radical revision, and it's very difficult to know how that will go. But certainly revision is important. But actually, it is a theme that's important even in the New Testament. I mean, for example, you might think of um, Paul suggesting his readers put everything to the test. And what it means by that is check things out. You know, you know, have you got them right? And of course, that theme uh, was very much on our agendas, we some of our agendas in October of last year when we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Because in many ways, that was people, not all Martin Luther, but also others around them, saying, we think Christianity may have got some things wrong. We need to correct it by going back to the New Testament and seeing if we can, in effect, realign and get it right this time. So in other words, there is, a, there is this innate tendency, at least in that version of Christianity, to try and correct itself if it feels it's taken the wrong turn. Now again, it's not what needs to be said, but that, I think, begins to answer that question. And so we come to our fourth question, which is... Um, um, I can't read my own writing. <laughs> it says, can science deal with uh, metaphysics? Is that right? Yes. Well, it's a good question, because um, one of the major issues which, for example, arose um, in the Vienna School, which was very radically empirical, was this question about you know, whether science, in effect, is radically empirical, dealing with observations. And if you're able to generalize, what status do those generalizations have? And more difficulty, if your, um, if your observations seem to imply there is something that is currently unobservable as an explanation of these, is that in effect ruled out of court by the fact that it is not empirical? And I, my answer to your question, which I'll stress a very good question, is that science does not actually begin with a presupposition of any metaphysics. In effect, you, you begin by making observations, and then you begin to say, right, given this, what is the bigger picture that makes sense of this? You begin to build up these pictures. And what I think you might say is that metaph a metaphysics, perhaps a modest metaphysics, is not the presupposition of science, but it may be its outcome. I think one of the reasons why many scientists are, have misgivings about metaphysics is that very often it's about metaphysical predetermination. In other words, this is laid down in advance and science has to operate within that framework, which I don't think is right at all. I think, in effect, science is one of those wonderful enterprises which says, let's begin by observing, by, by doing experiments, and gradually building up this picture of reality, which I think gives us the sense of... Um, of a bigger picture. So for me, it's not inconsistent to be a scientist and to have metaphysical views, but I would hope that those metaphysical views would come after the scientific process rather than before them. So I think we may have time for one or two more, and then we must end. So let's, uh, we have three men, one woman. Can we try and rectify the balance? Hello, um, it seemed to me that you did accept the biconditional that humans care about finding meaning even only if there is meaning. I'm just wondering how much space you make in your thought for the possibility that these are just psychological phenomena and that these levels of reality that you're referring to don't actually exist. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a good question, actually. I think we're gonna, if I answer this question, I'm going to do this good, we're going to reach time. So this is our last question, but it's a very good question to go on with. Um, what you are doing is really raising this real question about whether in order to explain reality, we have to develop constructs, in other words, things that are not 
real entities in the world that help us to organize our thoughts or establish correlations, something like that. I mean, an example of a construct might be intelligence. I mean, I mean we don't actually observe intelligence. We, it's a kind of where a framing device for a whole range of things, but we think we know what we mean when we use it. And it's the same with meaning, that actually what we're doing is struggling to put into words something which is basically something that, that is very important for a lot of people. And it focuses on those questions I mentioned, like, for example, um, who am I? The question of, do I really matter to anybody? The question of, can I make a difference to things? But your question is good because you, you're, you're asking, in effect, are these simply questions which have their roots in a inside us, and they have no relation to an external reality whatsoever. In other words, there are indications that we may be malfunctioning or something like that. And it's a very good question. And again, uh, you know, there's a very large psychological literature on this, and one of the things they, they struggle with is, in effect, to say, this is normal. That's a very judgmental view. And this is abnormal. How, how do you make that judgment? Very often it's done by saying, well, there are a lot of people who take this viewpoint, it might be normal, but actually that's not really good criteria. So here's what, here's what I think in response to your very good question. I can't prove this to be true. That's why I like the question so much. It's a good question. But it does raise the question of whether we delude ourselves. You know, Forbach is saying, you know, in his writing of the 1830s, that what we do is because we are sad and lonely people, we project our longings and call the outcome God or something like that. And Feuerbach is saying, look, just don't do it, just face up the way things are, don't do that. But actually, that's simply one way of doing things. One of the things that's said about Feuerbach is this. What Feuerbach does in effect say that the wish gives rise to the other words. We almost like create a world which is some are effects of our own desires. And I think all of us do that. There are a lot of historians who would argue that, for example, the rise of modern atheism is partly a effects of desire that won't be a god, so we can do whatever we like. Now, it's more complicated than that. But again, you can see this. So your question is, how can we check out whether these are valid instincts, valid desires? And, you know, I don't think we can do that. I don't think there's any empirical test I can think of that will deal with that. What I can say, though, is it's, 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 it's human. You know, it's the way we are. That quote from Jeanette Winston, she's just saying, look, you know, this is the way we are. Now, um, maybe we shouldn't be like that, but we are. And the question, therefore, is do we have a world who is able to engage us in that actual situation? And so I think that that's why I would take my own position as well, saying I can't say this is right, I can't say it's wrong. But like C.S. Lewis, who I mentioned right at the beginning of my lecture, he has this feeling that deep human intuitions actually might be pointing to something really important. And I, I'm happy to go along with that. Again, I can't prove that's right. But nevertheless, I just feel there's something in us. If you take a Christian perspective, um, then you would say, well, is this idea of the image of God. And in many ways, that's saying it's a kind of homing instinct for God which expresses itself in the sense of being drawn to something deep, being dissatisfied by what we experience in this world, and so on. So you know, that, 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 again, is one way of looking at it. But of course, there are others, and one of them might be, actually, this is just something we invent. I don't think that's right, but you're right. We can't prove that that's wrong. Now, I don't end with someone, though, but it's, it's a good question, and I think we can trust our intuitions more than we think. But in the end, it's a question of whether we can prove that. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had five wonderful questions. Can we applaud our questioners? Because I mean, they're, 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 Real will be a space for honest and open discussion 
where we can explore together some of the huge questions of life, like what actually is real, and how can we be real with one another? And particularly, does Christianity have convincing answers to those questions? Uh, there'll be a series of lunchtime and evening talks running every day, with plenty of time for questions. And there'll be a cafe open for discussion in the afternoons, all at St Andrew's Street Baptist Church. So do please grab one of these flyers on your way out for all of the details. Uh, the last thing to say is that we'd love to hear any feedback you have about tonight's talk. Um, so on the way out, if, you, if you'd like to leave any thoughts, or if you'd like to get in contact with anyone from the Christian Union, um, you'll see these little tiny cards uh, just by the door and a little box to put them in. So yeah, do do that if you'd like uh, to get in touch. Thank you so much for coming, and I really hope to see you lots of you next week.